Welcome to this week's weekly webinar series. My name is Molly Keck and I am an integrated pest management with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Bexar County and I'm also a board cert certified entomologist. So this week we're really going to be discussing those insects that come out when the oven gets turned on and the summer sun is out there baking everything. Sometimes you don't think that insects can be around when it's so hot because other animals kind of go away and take high, uh, but insects certainly can be very active as the sun starts to heat up. So what happens to those insects when it gets hot? Well, they do a number of different things. They either adapt to the heat, they reproduce faster. Really, heat does not negatively affect our insects. What it can actually do is make things happen faster for them. So oftentimes we see more insects in the summer and during the warmer temperatures than we do when it's cooler. And the reason why increased temperatures help them is because it increases their reproductive rate. So let's say that we have earlier heat in our, in our summer or spring. That means that they're waking up from the winter and they start breeding earlier in the year, which of course is gonna lead to an increased insect population. It speeds up the duration of the insect's life cycle. So to go from egg to adult takes less time than it would when it's cooler. And it also decreases the time between the insect's generation. So you just in general have a lot more insects out when it's warmer. Insects can compensate for the intense heat too. You have to know that they're not warm blooded. And so the heat doesn't really affect them like it would mammals or humans where we would not enjoy it. Um, slow down what we eat, do other things to try to avoid the heat. These guys actually enjoy it, but those that can't tolerate the heat might do certain things. They might just find shade. I mean, insects are small, so the shade of your porch, the shade under trees, the shade in the canopy of, tree, of the tree decreases the temperature for them quite a bit. It makes things a bit more tolerable. They might seek indoors. So one of the most common insects or, or arthropods that we see coming inside are scorpions, right? In the summertime, their activity increases, they're seeking moisture and they're seeking cooler temperatures just like we are. And they squeeze their way inside when they feel the temperature difference between our air conditioned inside and the heat on the outside. They might also just increase water intake, which decreases the temperature that they have inside of their bodies. So you might see more insects attracted to water, especially our social insects like wasps and bees because they're taking that water back to cool off their hive and to feed their young. Or they just turn nocturnal. Really common example of this is um, many different species of ants. Leafcutter ants and fire ants in particular become more active in the evening time when the temperatures are cooler and stay inside of their hives deep down in the ground during the daytime. So um, some of our heat loving insects are good guys and some of them are certainly pests. And so that's really what we're going to talk about is which ones, which pests are out and what they do that causes us to become very irritated by them. We always like to practice what's called or I always like to promote what's practice integrated pest management. And I am an integrated pest management program specialist. So this is what I know and understand and, and teach. And I just want to remind you that integrated pest management is a way to um, reduce pesticide use or utilize pesticides that are smarter, that are more target specific. We want to try to use other methods, cultural, sanitation, physical, mechanical control are good guys. And as a last resort, oftentimes we're utilizing pesticides. So basically, overall, you want to keep your plants happy and healthy, and that will reduce its stress, which will reduce the insects that are attracted to it. Remember that IPM tries to utilize all relevant methods to manage pests to a level that you can tolerate. And that is big because what the plant can tolerate and what you can tolerate might be two completely different things. Oftentimes, humans have a much lower tolerance than our plants actually do. And so we need to recognize, is the plant still doing what it's supposed to do? Is, is it still overall healthy, even though it has a few insects on it? Is it really justified to put out pesticides? So cultural control is the bottom of our pyramid. It is the stepping blocks, the, the bottom of the ladder, the most important part. And you're basically making the environment happier for the plant and therefore unhealthy or unhappy for the pest. So they go alternate places. So we are understanding their life cycle and, and knowing where they might breed. Are they breeding in weeds? Um, do they breed in organic matter? What are they attracted to that they then turn and feed on our plants? We are fertilizing and watering our plants regularly and properly so that they're healthy and not stressed out. 
We are purchasing the proper varieties of plants, so we're not trying to purchase plants that are grown in Montana to try to grow in Texas. We are understanding which plants can tolerate our fluctuating temperatures, our intense heat, and sometimes very cold snaps. We're also planting them the proper distance apart. We're not overcrowding things in our vegetable or our landscape so that, that we're not encouraging insects to have hiding places. And we also want to reduce physical damage. When, an, when a plant, especially a big tree or a shrub, is physically damaged, insects are attracted to that damage and they start to feed or uh, start to live on that plant and it causes problems that we don't really want to experience. Mechanical control is excluding the pests or physically removing them in some way. So we are handpicking them off. We're utilizing grow covers so they can't get to the plants. Inside of our house, we use window screens and doors that we keep shut so that insects can't make their way inside. You maybe have heard of using sharp blasts of water and also turning the soil over so whatever eggs are in the soil or under the mulch is now exposed to the sunlight and you allow the sun to desiccate those eggs so you have a, a smaller population the next year. And then we have biological control. This is using your good guys to kill your bad guys. And you can do this by releasing beneficial insects, but by and large, we cannot release the proper amounts for an open system such as our yard. This is more successful when you augment and you just inundate the area. You, you purchase a lot of beneficial insects and you release tons of them. Not something that we really do as homeowners, but certainly on uh, in a commercial setting, this can be accomplished. So instead, what we can do successfully is recognize that we have good guys. Know who's good and know who's bad. So by doing that, we encourage our good guys to be there. We reduce pesticide use. Um, and maybe we use target specific pesticides. We know that our good guys are on top of the leaf, so we do a better job of treating underneath the leaf. Um, we know where the good guys like to hang out, so we don't apply the pesticide there. There's small things that we can do to try to utilize our, our beneficial insects, even our lizards and our birds that might come in and try to control our bad guys for us. And then as a last resort, we usually, usually use pesticides. And this is anything that kills, mitigates, or repels a pest. So it can be organic or it can be traditional pesticides as well. But regardless of what it is, we want to use that as a last resort when the other methods aren't helping. We want to try to encourage cultural or sanitation, physical control, not understanding who our good guys are before we grab for that can of pesticide. And also one thing to remember is that many of these pesticides are insecticides. They kill insects. And our beneficial insects are insects also. They don't discriminate against killing only bad guys versus good guys. It's up to us and how we apply it properly and when we apply it to accomplish that goal. So let's get into those top insects of summer. Number one on my list would be chinch bugs. So as things start to really heat up and the um, oven gets turned and cranked up in, on, in our environment, we start to see chinch bugs that will damage our grass. These guys prefer St. Augustine grasses, but if you have other grasses, they can sometimes get into those. However, for most of us as homeowners, it is St. Augustine grass that we're concerned with. And they feed on the thatch in that um, St. Augustine grass and cause some, some serious damage to the turf. Usually it starts out as yellowing leaves, or, um, and then it will start to become dead marginalized by more yellowing leaves next to the live grass. Um, this is really common <clears throat> damage and it's very typical of them, but sometimes it's hard to spot that yellowing grass. So usually what we see is it's the parts of the lawn because these guys thrive when it gets hot. It's the parts of the lawn that are um, closest to your sidewalks, your asphalt, your brick house, your hot fence, Places that either don't get good irrigation, like probably this little median, or are surrounded by heat absorbing surfaces. Also, you'll see it on the corner of a house right next to the sidewalk. If I have someone send me damage of their turf and it's right next to the sidewalk, I am almost always going to assume it's probably chinch bugs that are causing that damage. And here you can also see the dead portion marginalized by this yellowing color. So to control these guys, we know that they increase and ramp up reproduction when we have um, a lot of nitrogen in the soil. So if you can decrease fertilization, that will be incredibly important. You can try to increase moisture. So water a little bit more. 
Um, water a little bit longer if you can't, if you are limited on the days that you can water. You're trying to make that soil cooler so that chinch bugs don't become a problem. If we have a summer where it rains all the time and never really gets very hot and you see damage to your turf, I promise that's a fungus and not chinch bugs because they like hot and dry. You can also plant, if you're thinking about planting things, try to choose something that is a resistant variety like Floritam if it's in the sun or FJ Select if you are kind of in a semi-shade area and remove the thatch. If you do that, then they don't have a feeding source. And so you can do these things culturally without using pesticides to reduce those chinch bug issues. Remember that the dead grass will not grow back until it does grow back. So it's not going to happen right away. It's never going to be overnight and you may still have dead patches of grass throughout that summer season. For chemical control of chinch bugs, if you can't utilize the uh, cultural control methods, there are lots of products that work against chinch bugs. But the key is read the label so that you make sure you apply the pesticide for the proper life cycle found in the grass, which also means you've got to get on your hands and knees and you've got to see if you can find those little chinch bugs in the ground. Separate the soil, look deep down, see if you can find them there. You can also try to do the can method, which is where you would take like a coffee can or a PVC pipe and you would place it into the soil, fill it with some soapy water. Um, you're putting it in the yellow or the live grass right next to the yellow. And if after about 10, 15 minutes, there are insects that float to the top, then very likely these are chinch bugs. Take a look at them, figure out if they look like these little immatures, the very, very young ones that don't look to have wings, or if they look more like adults that kind of have these shiny colored wings. Lace bugs are another heat loving pest. And what these guys will do is get on many of your ornamental plants. They love azaleas, lantana, um, salvia, things that just do really well, even esperanza, things that do very well in the summertime. And they will feed on the juices of the plant and that leaves a stippled look or a bleaching look accompanied with dark specks underneath the leaves, which are either them or their fecal matter. Look under the leaf for the bugs. If you see them there, then you know that you've got lace bugs. These have lots of natural enemies. So oftentimes you can just tolerate them if possible to try to control them because the plant often can tolerate them. So cultural control things you can try to do is if they're potted, move them into more of a shaded area, decrease the temperature on those plants. Try to decrease drought stress by increasing watering. Use um, soaps and spinosad and neem oil Pretty much anything will kill these guys, but it's more um, how you apply and proper application that you're applying underneath the leaf than anything else. So there you can see that very typical damage on the front side of the leaf, the top of the leaf. And if you were to flip that leaf over, you would see all of the nymphs, maybe some adults, and a lot of fecal matter where they're feeding um, constantly. Again, tolerate where you can. See if the plant's still blooming and happy. Use plants that are better adapted for heat and your situation. If you're using a lot of plants that maybe aren't as drought tolerant or heat tolerant, then these guys are going to thrive a little bit more on them. And again, nearly all contact as foliar applications work, but you have to apply properly. They are not on top of the leaf. They are under. And so it's kind of a tedious way to apply a pesticide. Much easier to spray on top than it is to get a wand underneath. Spider mites are very similar to lace bugs in the type of damage that they do. But while lace bugs are pretty much um, specific to ornamental plants, spider mites will get on many of your vegetables, tomatoes and peppers. And if you have marigolds, they will feed on marigolds as well. They're very small, not really easy to distinguish them without a hands lens. And sometimes you might get some webbing from their infestations. So for control of them, you want to um, check and see if they're there. First of all, you have a stippled effect on the top side, but underneath you will not see the, the um, fecal matter or anything like you see with the lace bugs. You can barely even see them in this picture. They almost look like dirt. Try to clip and destroy the infested leaves or plants if it's possible. And again, increase watering, you're decreasing soil temperature, you're decreasing the temperature around that plant. Soaps and oils, forceful sprays of water, these can be kind of um, helpful and effective. But you must remember that spider mites are mites. They are not insects. And many of our products are insecticides. And so you want to use something, do a little research, and use something that is labeled as, an, as a miticide. Or read the label carefully and see if it says miticide on the label. 
There are a lot of extension um, uh, agencies in other states as well as Texas A&M AgriLife Extension that have a ton of fact sheets with good information for the type of plant where you're dealing with these spider mites to give you some um, active ingredients to look for when you go to the stores. Mosquitoes are certainly a summertime pest that we deal with all the time. We spend more time outside, they're more active in the summer, and by default, we get a lot of mosquito bites. Um, these guys have to have standing water to lay their eggs and complete their life cycle. The egg is laid on standing water, the larva develops inside of the water, feeds on the organic matter in the water, the pupa lives in the water, and only the adult flies around. So it's much easier to target a body of water than it is once the mosquitoes have started to fly. So reduce the standing water if you can, avoid the mosquitoes if you can, and use personal protection if you can't. On the adult sites, it's very hard to control the adults long-term and very successfully. So beyond controlling the water sources, which is what's attracted them to these areas, use any product that has mosquitoes on the label. The smaller the droplets, the better the application for mosquitoes. So if you can find a fogger versus um, something else that comes in a spray bottle, that's gonna be more effective. If you're utilizing something that you put inside of a pump sprayer, try to make your, your droplet size, so your nozzle, to be a very fine mist and that will be more helpful. You wanna treat at dawn and dusk. That's when most mosquitoes are most active. Um, and resting, and you're going to get more bang for your buck. And you spray around eye level and below. They're not necessarily going to be way above in your head, and you're not going to be able to get much product up there either. So, so focus on areas that are kind of along the, the height of your fence, eye level above your head just slightly and below. Or try to reduce adult resting sites if you can. If you have a lot of um, foliage that's unneeded, then um, you're going to have a lot of adults hanging around your, your landscape. Somebody nearby has water, though that's why they're there to begin with if you don't think it's you. It is so difficult to say reduce adult resting sites, though, because sometimes it can be a very well-maintained lawn like this one. But this is, a, this is an area where you would stand and probably be uh, having a lot of mosquitoes attracted to you. Again, here, where there's a lot of shade and foliage, probably some standing water in these pots, maybe some water below the bricks, but places like that, these mosquitoes are going to love to hang out and you're going to be bitten by them. So if you can't avoid this area and you can't reduce um, all of the, the water, then the best thing that you can do is avoid being outdoors or use insect repellent of your choice. So grasshoppers will come out in the summertime because right now they are um, immatures and they're starting to grow a little bit bigger. And usually when it gets really hot, we start to see them chomping on our peach trees and our citrus trees and our other fruit trees that we might have in the yard. They make very large and irregular shaped holes um, along the margin toward the inside of the leaf. And they feed on pretty much anything. While they love fruit trees, they'll also feed on waxy and bitter tasting bushes. They really kind of don't care. The, the best control for grasshoppers is try to cut down on the summer weeds. So especially if you live in an area where you have pasture next to you or more of a, an easement or a, a wildscape next to you, places that you can't control, then um, you're going to have an issue with grasshoppers better more than somebody who lives in a typical landscape where everybody around you has a manicured front lawn. If you live next to that pasture area or you own that pasture area, try to, till, to till those areas and disturb them where they lay the eggs and do that early on in the summer. So right now we've already surpassed that, right? Sprays usually offer little residual, so you're spraying often, often, often. So look and see if the plant is otherwise doing just fine. When they go after your fruit, you do want to do something about it, right? But if the plant, if it's just a bush, um, it has tons of leaves, you can't really see that they're feeding on it, you probably don't need to be overly concerned about it. There are some bug baits like no low bait that you can use, but you only apply that really when the nymphs are present and it works way too slowly for immediate control. So for homeowners, it's not really feasible. Instead, if you want some immediate control and you don't want to utilize pesticides, try row covers. But by and large, it's controlling what is, um, it's, it's controlling and disturbing the area around where you have plants that you want to salvage. Number six on my list are the wasps. Wasps are much more active and most social insects are more active in the summertime. Social insects being ants, bees, and wasps. 
And this is because they have ramped up reproduction. There's lots of food sources for them. All of their babies are turning into adults and they're just, there's just more of them. And so we see more of them. So in these pictures on my left-hand side, I have a picture of a cicada killer wasp, which is not a social insect. It is solitary, but they are much more active in the summertime because cicadas are more active. In the center is a true southern yellow jacket. We also might have eastern yellow jackets around here, but a southern yellow jacket. They are social and they are very aggressive and very mean. And then on the right-hand side is just one of the many, many species of our paper wasps that we have here in Texas. Um, paper wasps can be aggressive. All of these guys are predatory. Um, all of these guys go after a little bit of nectar and so as a result are, are pollinating a little bit. So they do have some beneficial qualities to them. If they don't bother you, then leave them alone. These are also not the Asian giant hornet. You've heard this probably on the news and I have been getting millions of pictures of different insects that where people are assuming that they have um, the Asian giant hornet erroneously, very erroneous, erroneously called the murder hornet. And you can just see from these pictures, the Asian giant hornet in the center is very large, incredibly larger than any of the wasps that we have here. Although I will say the picture of their species of cicada killer looks kind of small. Um, I think that ours are uh, similar in size probably to the Asian giant hornet, but certainly not as large and definitely not as um, wide in shape. The, sh the color of the head is kind of what gives it away. If you still think that you found a picture of one, you can send it to me, but we know at this time in June of 2020 that we do not have the Asian giant hornet anywhere close to the state of Texas. For wasp management, if you can't live with them, if you, if you cannot learn to live with them because they have their beneficial qualities, you treat each one a little differently. Paper wasps, just buy that aerosol can of wasp spray and treat that nest early in the morning or late in the evening when everybody is at the nest. Knock the nest down and then go and spray something on it that has ammonia. That will keep them from coming back to build in the same spot or will we'll try to help them not build in the same spot. It erases the pheromone that tells them this is a good place to live. Might also erase the pheromone that tells the slaggers, the laggers that hadn't made it back to the nest, or were leaving because you did a little bit too late in the morning to go find food, that that's where their home was. For cicada killer wasps, if you can leave them alone, I absolutely would. But if you can't, find the entrance hole that they're coming in and out of and laying their eggs in, dust it with the pesticide, and see if as they crawl in and out, they get it on their body and die from it. And for yellow jackets, I would absolutely call a professional. I myself have a V suit. I have a license. I still would not treat for yellow jackets on my own because they are very aggressive and very mean. Um, and you want someone who knows what they're doing to try to control them for you. Filth flies are number seven on my list because as things heat up, stuff starts to decay and flies become very numerous. Their reproduction also really, really speeds up when, um, when it's a little bit warmer. Filth flies could be house flies or blow flies, and they breed in decaying organic matter. So this could be fecal material, it could be compost, it could be trash, it could be anything that you can think of. Um, as long as it's decaying organic matter, they will lay their eggs in it and be attracted to those areas. They're attracted to the area to eat and to lay eggs. So for controlling these guys, reduce the breeding sites. That is really the key. You could spray all day, every day, but you're never going to control them if they have a place to lay their eggs. If you have a chicken coop in your backyard, let things dry out. Clean up that chicken manure. Um, if things are stinky, house flies and, and blow flies are going to find their way there. Um, if it's really, really wet in your compost bins, let that stuff dry out. If um, anything is decaying in your trash cans, they're going to be attracted to that too. So keep trash cans away from the house. Let things dry out very well. Um, don't add water to manure and reduce any manure that's close by. The other thing you can try are fly traps. All that is is really stinky stuff that they're hopefully attracted to more than they're attracted to whatever they're coming to your landscape for. And they get trapped in there and they die from it. It's a way to monitor and try to figure out where they are. It's a way to kind of maybe discourage them from being close to a certain area, but it is not the best way to try to control them. And if all else fails, you could always just put a bunch of Venus fly traps all over your yard and see if that helps with the situation. I have fleas on fleas and ticks on here as number eight. Fleas especially become more abundant in the summertime and ticks 
are not that far behind them. Um, I would just have you recognize the life cycle of a flea because that helps you understand where they're hanging out and hiding. So fleas lay their eggs on the host. The host moves and jumps around and the flea eggs fall down. So the eggs are found in the bedding around where the host is resting all the time. Then those flea eggs turn into flea larvae, which are feeding on the dried blood fecal material of the adults. And then they, they will turn into pupa and they will take carpeting and other material and wrap themselves up in it. The eggs and the pupa are very well protected from pesticides. The larva and the adults are a little bit more exposed. So control of these guys would be to treat both the pet, the home, and the outdoors at the same time. Inside the house, the best place where you can treat is by vacuuming and laundering where the pet rests and lays most of the time. You can control the eggs, the larva, and the pupa significantly that way. Outdoors, you're going to apply where it's shaded, a little bit cooler, maybe under a deck, places like that, as opposed to right out in the direct sunlight. And for your pets, go to the veterinarian, get a product that works well. Um, oftentimes the products that you buy over the counter, because they're over the counter and we have overused them too much, we have resistance to those active ingredients against fleas. So try to use newer products. If something doesn't work, try something with a different active ingredient. Always read the label when you apply it to a live animal. And then be sure to repeat the house and the outdoors every 14 to 10 days later, because that will control your eggs and your pupa who have now turned into larvae and adults. Um, as far as vacuuming, vacuum every day, twice a day, three times a day, as often as you can, because that will really help control your insect population by well over 50%. If you cannot control the wildlife or the neighbor's pets that are bringing the fleas to your yard, then consider using um, an in something that has an insect growth regulator in them. In them and that would be one of, there are a number of products here that I have listed. Um, insect growth regulators would be methoprene, proproxor, and pyroproxifen. What these things do is they either prevent the adults from laying viable eggs or they prevent the eggs or larvae from continuing to develop. So they are warped, they are deformed, and so um, they never become adults to continue the life cycle. So you can see on the right hand side, I have. Um, IGR uh, listed for methoprene and for pyroproxifen. I, I guess propoxer is probably not a um, IGR. And for ticks, the only thing I'm really going to mention about ticks is that you do want to try to control them. Ticks are pretty dirty and they carry a lot of different diseases. And we have a fabulous app that is provided and updated very regularly by the Texas A&M Tick Lab. So check out that tick app. You can identify things. You can learn about their biology. You can turn to learn about what kind of diseases they spread, but you can also learn about control and management for your specific situations. And those specific situations might be on your livestock, on your pets, in your house or in your backyard. So it's a very, very helpful website to give you all the tick information that you need. And that's what I always refer people to. Now we're looking at a couple insects as we round out the end of this presentation that are not really considered a pest, but I just wanted to throw in a couple insects that you may recognize as seeing very often when it gets very hot, and then maybe one that you don't often realize is there. But number nine certainly are cicadas. Cicadas are often called locusts, which is also erroneous. Um, they are a ground-dwelling insect that feeds on the roots of trees when it's um, fall time until summer, and then they emerge as this adult, break open that, well, emerge as the little nymph, break open that shell of the skin, um, fly up and mate, make tons of noise in the trees. There, are, You have probably heard of the 14-year and the seven-year cicada. What we typically have in Texas is our annual dog day cicada. So most of our cicadas come out every summertime. So just because you hear cicadas in the tree does not mean that He's been in the ground for seven or 14 years, certainly not in Texas. Other parts of the world, they are a little bit more common, but even they have annual cicadas. So we don't really consider them a pest. And if you do, if you remember that, that cicada killer wasp, if you have those in your yard, let them do their job. Cicadas are just the sound of summer. They're not a landscape pest. Um, if anything, they're just a nuisance because they make a lot of noise. And then I put walking sticks in here because 
based on what the kids in my camps collect in the summertime, when it gets really hot, walking sticks are very abundant, but they're very, very um, uh, hidden and um, elusive and very, very well camouflaged, of course. And we don't consider these to be a pest. Um, even when we have huge outbreaks of them and you have what seems to be hundreds of them up in live oak trees, they just don't eat enough to really cause enough damage to warrant us doing anything about them. They're scary. They're weird looking. They're very slow and phantom-like in the way that they move, but they're completely harmless to you. Thank you for joining us for this week's weekly webinar series where we cover the heat-loving pests of summer. Um, make sure that you check out other webinars like this one right here on this YouTube channel, My Extension 210.